you spend a ton of time training your SDRs only to find that they make the same mistake over and over again, take months to ramp, and have trouble making quota? Yoda AI by RingDNA delivers AI-powered conversation guidance so that every rep can sell like your top performer. In real time, deliver talking points that help reps overcome sales objections, stay on message, and beat the competition. You'll never have to endlessly repeat sales advice to reps again. It's easy to set up, easy to customize, and comes with out-of-the-box coaching best practices. Turn your team into a revenue-driving machine today with Yoda AI by RingDNA. To learn more, visit ringdna.com slash Yoda. That's ringdna.com slash Y-O-D-A. Often I say to people, have you set up a Google alert for your top five customers? They all go, oh my God, well, that's a genius move. It's like, no, it's just a really simple, respectful thing to do for your client. And it creates an opportunity for you to listen to them in a way when you're not available. So you just get the technology working for you. Some sales automation systems have this embedded in that. But just that simple orientation to move yourself to go, how can I invest in listening? Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. That is Oscar Trimbley. And Oscar is the author of a book titled Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. And listening is one of my favorite topics because listening is the way that you give value to the words of other people, like your buyers. In my conversation with Oscar, we dig into the difference between hearing and listening And he talks about multiple academic studies that show that between 50 and 55% of your working day is actually spent listening. And we all know it's certainly harder now to make yourself heard among all the noises out there with your buyers, for instance. So we dig into why we feel frustrated and isolated and confused because we aren't heard by our buyers or understood and why our buyers are frustrated and confused because they aren't heard and understood by us. Oscar also dives into the five levels of listening. These are different ways of listening to ensure that you make, really make sure that you truly understand what the other person means, what your buyer means. So we get into all this and much, much more. But before we get to Oscar, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Good day, Oscar. Welcome to the show. G'day, Andy. Looking forward to listening to your questions today. Ah, there we go. Put the pressure on me right from the start. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I had to throw the obligatory good day in because, good day, because, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Australian business and, and <laughs> I used to do runs in the Royal Botanical Garden in Sydney. And, I would get stopped a lot by people who apparently thought I looked Australian asking me for <laughs> for directions. <laughs> and I hated to disappoint them, but I didn't know where I was other than I could still see my hotel across from the park. <laughs> and for those of you listening who haven't had a chance to run in the botanic gardens that Andy has, uh, on one side you see the Sydney Harbour Bridge, on the other side you see the Opera oh, House. Wow. On the other side, you see a naval base. On the other side, you see the most expensive real estate in Australia, and uh, they've done an amazing job uh, through the floods recently, Andy, of uh, helping those gardens survive uh, an enormous amount of water. Water coming from the bay or from? No, we just had uh, a week and a half of floods on the east coast of Australia, so... uh, the, the gardens were literally rivers. The running tracks you were on created fantastic rivers for the, <laughs> for sure. the water to run through. From I'm sure you can remember the top of the stairs there at Mrs. Macquarie's chair and yeah. uh, having, having, having that. Well, that was basically a waterfall as the rain oh, wow. came down. Yeah. Well, I used to go swimming in the Andy Boyd Charlton pool as well. So I'd oftentimes have my sw- <laughs> swimsuit on under my running s- running shorts and I'd have my goggles in one hand and do a run then hop in the pool and I had to learn how to circle swim backwards for what I was uh, accustomed to so it's uh people think huh yeah yeah we swim on the opposite side of the street as well 
Yeah. Yeah, having having uh, uh, hiked a couple of fourteeners in uh, Colorado, I got in trouble many times hiking on the wrong side of the track there, and uh, <laughs> people will confuse me for someone from England uh, rather right. than someone from Australia. But the vitriol coming out of their mouths was exactly the same. It's <laughs> telling right. me to get on the other side of the track. That's right. All right. Well, let's let's dive into it. We're going to talk about listening. Since you put me on the spot with my, you're going to be judging my listening throughout the entire episode. But you've read. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just. No, I'm not. Dude, you're Daniel imperfect. Dog. I'm imperfect. Everybody's trying to make progress, Andy. Right. All right. You've written a book, Deep Listening: Impact Beyond Words. So, what was the the impetus to write the book? Like most things, uh, if I shut my mouth long enough, other people would tell me wh- where to go. So, uh, as I was consulting in the space, many of my clients put pressure on me and said, you know, time time to write a book, Oscar. You know, we'd like to share this with our staff and you can't be here in all the conversations. Can you, can you write a book? So, eventually, I took the time to put together what I'd coded out of a conversation that happened at a budget meeting seven years earlier. And uh, my vice president said to me, at the end of this meeting, we need to speak. And when your vice president says that to you in a budget meeting, it can't be good. And Tracy asked me to shut the door. And she basically said to me, you had no idea what you did at the 20 minute mark in our meeting. And the meeting was a budget setting meeting for the annual revenue plan between Singapore, our regional head office and our global head office in Seattle. And No, I had no idea what I did, and I just figured I was going to get fired. And uh, Tracy said to me at the 20-minute mark, you changed the way everybody in the room listened. If you could code how you listen, you could change the world. And all I could say was code or code code, because I wasn't sure if you meant make it into a methodology or a framework or put it in software. And she said, no, 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 code is code. We, we're at Microsoft, Oscar, write it, get it into software. And uh, the, I figured, yeah, that's a starting point. So I think the book is one of the first times where we captured the framework of something I did six weeks later where the finance director asked me to come into his team meeting and audit his listening. So between Tracy and Brian and listening to them, they kind of set me on this journey and the book was uh, a result of clients asking me to write it. And uh, it was a really insightful process because I wanted a book that would be read rather than a dust collecting shelf trophy. Mm. So it's a, it's a very small format and book, it's, yeah. designed, it's designed to be carried around and it's designed to be used. And I've had people send me photos from a a riverbank in Germany from uh, uh, Petronius Towers in KL in Malaysia, all taking photos of them with a book. And and the book is really designed to make sure that people understand that listening is something you can practice and something you can improve because the cost of not listening in commercial context is huge. And right. in selling, pretty obvious. Uh, you you don't listen, you lose so, well, so what happened in that meeting that was this that Tracy recognized as some sort of seminal moment in terms of understanding listening? If you can picture you've got a global headquarters always pitching for a number that the business think is unrealistic, a mm-hmm. business always low-balling for a number that they think they can overachieve and overachieve on their revenue plan so they can earn as much commission as possible. That That's the dynamic and the tension in the meeting. And at the 20-minute mark, I just asked everyone if they could pause and expose the assumptions behind their point of view because everybody was saying the growth figure needs to be X or it needs to be X times three. But nobody was saying here are the assumptions that sit inside our model. So I just asked everybody if they could spend five minutes to deconstruct the drivers and the assumptions in their revenue model. And what we learned very quickly is the head office had made some geographic comparisons between Australia, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, Mm. which were kind of in the ballpark, but there was some variability there. We also in the subsidiary had made some assumptions about product uptake that they were mapping differently. And as a result of everybody exposing the underlying assumptions in the model of the revenue plan, all of a sudden we we came to a really good place. In fact, the meeting finished early 
And we got a revenue plan that we were comfortable with, they were comfortable with, and, and our regional HQ was really surprised because everybody took the time to explain what was sitting behind the number rather than arguing for the number in the revenue plan. So right. it was getting them to listen to each other, I think, is what Tracy noticed, where it wasn't just expose what are the drivers in the plan, but also to get the people to start to listen to each other and the underlying assumptions rather than assuming a bad motivation. You know, they're always trying to give us a bigger mm -hmm. number. Uh, and, and and in that moment, like, I didn't think it was rocket science to ask that question, but Tracy said I had, had developed quite a reputation over the previous decade at Microsoft of asking those kinds of questions that were all about listening. Yeah, and I so having heard that story and, and having read the book, I mean, I put just a little bit different spin on it, which is I would have said you had a reputation for wanting to understand Right, it seems like there was a lot of bureaucratic momentum that was built up. Hey, we're just we know we're going to infight about this, and we're going to negotiate to the nth degree, without really understanding what's driving the motivations behind each all the or the assumptions you said behind all these these fact figures. Yeah, yeah, I think curiosity plays a huge role there. Right, I mean, but I mean, you see this in sales all the time. Is is yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really understand why you're saying it or what's behind it, and to me, I guess I see listening and understanding as being inseparable. Yeah, and, and I would too. And I would say the distinction, particularly in selling, uh, is that people who listen okay in a selling situation are, are listening to get the sale and beat the competition. But, but great sellers and great listeners are listening for the business case and listening for the customer's customer's problem. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a listening that's a little bit more systematic in sellers that are orientated around the business case that the customer has to sell internally. Mm -hmm. And they do a really good job of, of listening. Yes, there'll be some objections around uh, functional fit or the pricing or terms and conditions or implementation time schedules or whatever they may be. But I think really good sellers ask questions like who's involved in the approval process of what do they care about? How, how long does this take? Because I think too, too many sellers are, are listening for a sales cycle rather than listening for a procurement process or a buying cycle. Well, and they're listening to respond oftentimes, right? Is you know, How do I respond in such a way that keeps us on track, keeps us in the process, as opposed to, let's pause for a second, let's make sure we really understand any of the variables that you talked about, and then be able to help the customer in a better position than just these assumptions. And yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, I think it's sort of a <laughs> endemic in many respects to, to so many sellers, is this is the way they've been trained, right? This, we're going to get through this process and and take objection handling. You already talked about raising objections. Is for me, objections are nothing but questions. Hmm. Customers asking a question, they don't understand something, so they're surfacing it. And if you really understood what was behind the reason and the rationale why they're asking the question, then you can you have to listen for it, and then you can understand where they're coming from. You can provide an answer as opposed to trying to. The classic handle the objection, which is mm. deflection for the most part. Yeah, I was working recently with a, a, a sales organization in the in the software space, and they were telling me the the upside in a in a national retailing chain was completely dried up, and I said. Oh, okay. Really, at this time with everything going on, and uh, they said, "Yeah, well, you know, we've sold everything we can possibly sell to them." I said, "Great." And in that assumption, how about their supply network? And they went, "Well, what do you mean?" I said, "Well, before this meeting, I went to their website, looked at their five strategic ob objectives for the next five years, and one of them is supply chain quality." Mm -hmm. And your software helps them with that as the organization buying. But what about all that network of people selling into that organization? And they went, 
like the meeting just stopped with these sales managers because you could see the eyes were going like a slot machine going, right. oh, my God, we can now use this national retailer uh, effectively as a channel to market. Mm-hmm. Now, the good the good news is uh, the, the national retailer actually wants their help to do that and has made invitations and is running webinars to introduce the supplier to their suppliers. Right. And all because their orientation was, you know, how do we sell something to this customer as opposed to what's the customer's problem? What are they trying to solve and what's their customer's problems? Yep. And all of a sudden, the addressable market opportunity for that organization and that sales unit, they're 100x in their thinking of what they were before. But you're right, Andy, too many people just put people in a process and don't think over the second part of the question. Mm-hmm. What's 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 their customer's problem and how can you help them solve their customer's problem? Too many people are just solving the customer's problem that sits in front of them because they're right. only listening with that orientation. Well, and even more so, the example you just gave is not what's their customer's customer's problem, what's their customer supplier's problem, yeah. how can I help them? I mean, on both sides of the supply chain, absolutely. No, and I think for many people who sell into the public sector as well, uh, thinking about that in the context of not just what do the elected officials and the bureaucrats think about, what are rate payers, what are voters, you know, mm-hmm. when, you can think, when you can think beyond that, all of a sudden your addressable market opportunity opens up. Yeah, it might take a little longer and it's not going to fit into 13 weeks of a sales quarter. Right. But it will help broaden your addressable market. And for sure, when if you're struggling now and your organization's got a really narrow product fit in, in terms of what you're selling, move your orientation and start thinking about how to use your, your customers and their suppliers as channels to market rather than only thinking about them as the unit you can sell to. Right. And, that, and that's just listening in a really different way. Well, you framed the problem in a good way early in the book. And you, you talk about academic studies show that people are spending basically half their day listening, working day, listening. Mm. And yet now where this is supposed to be taking place in an environment where social media and technology has enabled everybody to have a megaphone and broadcast. (laughs) And so the proportion of of broadcast to reception has changed dramatically. It's a very noisy environment out there. And the more senior you are and the more selling time you're doing, the more of your day you're going to spend listening. On average, 55% of your day is spent listening. But in sales management roles particularly, you're spending up to 72% of your day just listening. And it's a skill that all of us need to understand how do we change, not just at the individual conversation level, Andy, but also thinking about if we're investing in all these technologies to broadcast, to what extent are we investing in technologies to listen? Because, you know, often often I say to people, just have you set up a Google alert for your top five customers? Mm-hmm. And they all think, they all go, oh, my God, well, that's a genius move. It's like, no, it's just a really <laughs> simple, respectful thing to do right. for your client. Yep. And, and, it, and it creates an opportunity for you to listen to them in a way when you're not available. Mm-hmm. So you just get the technology working for you. Some sales automation systems have this embedded in that. Yep. But just that simple orientation to move yourself to go, how can I invest in listening? Customer satisfaction surveys, help desk tickets in uh, problems that customers call and log into the system. Uh, it, I find so much opportunity for my clients when I say to them, great, what are the top 10 help desk themes that we're getting right now? Mm -hmm. And they all go, who cares? It's like, no, that's your current pipeline of opportunity for both product development and sales. Are you listening there? Right. So, and Andy, back to the point, the last decade, we have been enabled with more scheduling software to broadcast on social media. We've enabled more emails to be sent out. But the care and the effort it takes when somebody logs a, a information in a customer contact center, for you to go back and just listen to the top 10 themes, that's where the low-hanging fruit and opportunity mm-hmm. is for most people, but they're not taking the time to go and listen there. 
No. Well, right, because their priorities have been set in different directions, right? It's all about what's the activities that you're undertaking to generate leads, to you know, convert through your funnel, blah, 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 blah. As opposed to saying, look, let's let's put a priority on making our customers feel heard and understood. I mean, this is the thing that's that's for me is is frustrating when I deal with sellers is for them to understand this idea is that feeling understood is a huge source of value for buyers, right? If they're talking with a variety of, of your competitors, and if you're the one that makes them feel comfortable that you really understand what they're talking about, what their concerns are, what their issues are, what their goals, their desired outcomes are, and not just at a superficial level, but you really understand beyond asking sort of the standard discovery question, that works to your advantage in a significant way. And I, and I think there's a great distinction you made between heard and understood. And I want to play with discovery versus exploration because I think really good sales listeners mm-hmm. uh, explore first, then discover. I think discovery also has an orientation around like we, we know the answer. So right. I think one of the things I get sales leaders and sales teams to think about is the process of exploration early on. So if you you think about the first third, the middle third, and the last third Uh of any customer buying process, that first third, if you spend more time exploring, you're probably going to find multiple opportunities rather than the single opportunity the minute they mention some product code name that rings a little bell in your head that goes, ah, yes, that's the opportunity you go really deep or really fast on that. Exploring for a little bit longer helps you to discover more, but it also helps you prioritize where you can put your effort short, medium, and long-term around the sales cycle. Knowing that we can explore a little bit longer takes a more effort at the beginning, but what it does is it widens the funnel with quality customer-led buying priorities rather than pretend opportunities we're loading up into our CRM system to tick a box around percent of funnel at certain percentages in the sales stage. So explore a little bit longer, you'll discover more is what I'm saying. Oh, I love that. I love that. I've never heard it explained that way. I like that a lot. And it aligns with what I believe as well, which is that in that exploration stage is the customer is not trying to buy a product. They're trying to solve a problem. And they may not even know what the problem is, right? They may have an inkling, but as you, to your point, it, it could be a problem that's tangential to the one they thought they were trying to solve that gets discovered through this exploration. And sellers, in my mind, you have to think about this exploration phase. Is It's all about ideas. It's not about your product. You're exploring without a preset that's why I like this this metaphor. You're exploring without a, a preset agenda. And that's really hard for a lot of sellers the way they're trained these days because they're trained that their job is to persuade the buyer to buy their product. And it's like, well, but you don't know what the problem is. You're trying to sell the product without knowing what the problem is. And two years ago, we, we, we talked about exploration versus discovery with, with one of my client sellers. And what was interesting, they came back and she told me this story, which was they were selling to a technology part of an organization. They were dealing with a chief information officer. And this seller basically said, that problem that you've just explained as your priority one problem, I can't fix that, but I know the perfect organization who can. Mm-hmm. And she made, she made an introduction. Now, what was interesting was if you just looked at her sales performance, she just lost a possible sale. Now, she said at best they were a 10% fit. She found somebody who was a 90% fit who trusted and had a relationship with Mm -hmm. that client. Her biggest source of revenue for the next two years has been referrals from that CIO because that CIO trusted her because she solved his problem. Mm -hmm. without selling something that was in her SKU lineup or in her kit bag. Right. And as a consequence, he filled up her sales pipeline with great fit because Mm -hmm. when she said, I don't know that we're a great fit for that, I'm going to recommend an organization, he asked this very 
interesting reciprocal question. What problem are you a great fit for? And when he asked that, he was just tuning in his listening ears mm -hmm. and go, e every time I'm going to meet a colleague in my network of contacts, and he became a highly trusted referral source because if a colleague's referring you to a seller, and you're typically doing that before the buying cycle has right. even begun because they're describing a peer-to-peer -peer describing yep. problems. And, and, and that story stays with me because sometimes sellers don't realize their real value is the network of connections they can make to help whoever's in front of you solve some bigger problems that you can't with what you sell. Right. So that way you build trust and you're trusted in a way that somebody just selling a product won't ever be. And what's beautiful about that, she's moved organizations, that CIO is still recommending still business reckon, to yeah. her. I've, it's a great story. I mean, I've done that a few times in my career and it's paid off. I mean, but you only get to that point of saying, look, we're not a great fit if you're willing to really listen to the buyer, right? If you're willing to, because if you do that, you'll reach a point oftentimes, and you think about jumping around a little bit here, but yeah, I was reading something a few months ago about that roughly 50% of qualified opportunities in a B2B pipeline end up as a no decision. Right? The customer is saying, oh, look, we're going to stick with the status quo. Hmm. <laughs> so it means that you know, people are persisting to sell to these companies without fully understanding, in half the cases, without fully understanding the needs and concerns of that company. Because yeah. I would argue that if you truly did, then you would either say, look, we're not the right fit. Let us recommend somebody, or you would have disqualified and say, "Look, we're just not the right fit." Uh, even if you don't have a recommendation, but yeah, people are so wedded to this idea of I've got like a bull seeing a red cape. I've got that waving in front of me. I have to charge. And earlier on, we talked about great great sellers uh, listening for their business case, and that doesn't mean they're listening for the business case at the last third of the sales process, Andy. What they're doing is they're talking about the business case in the first conversation, mm -hmm. and that, that doesn't mean what's your budget. That's not a business case conversation. The, the business no. case conversation is what's going to change in the way the business performs as a result of this investment. Who is going to make that decision. What criteria will they use? And doing that up front helps the prospect get some credibility over their buying process mm -hmm. around building that business case. So, so for those 50% no decisions, the ones that really frustrate sellers the most, we prefer the yeses and the noes. It's the maybes that are the tax on our life. That's the things that slow down the pipeline performance. I think great sellers are listening really carefully for the business case right up front. Mm -hmm. And I think great sellers and sales managers are also deliberately listening for what's not said consistently. Right. So when you understand the neuroscience of speaking, listening, and thinking. So here's some numbers to consider. Most people speak at about 125 words a minute. A horse race caller will speak at about 200 words per minute. Most people can listen at about 400 words per minute, yet mm -hmm. most people can think at 900 words per minute. So think about this equation. When you're speaking to a buyer, they can speak at 125 to 150 words a minute. They're thinking at 900 words a minute. If you're just engaging with the first thing they say, you're engaging with 11% of what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you just take a little bit more time to listen to what they haven't said and ask about the next 125 words, some magic starts to happen. Some magic happens, you will notice when they say what they mean rather than what they just said. They'll take a deep breath in. They'll say words like, well, actually, Andy, what matters most in our organization? Or actually, Andy, what's really critical? Or 
and they always be preceded by a breath. The spine mm-hmm. will always go back. And if you're only doing audio-based selling, meaning you're doing it over the phone, you can listen for that breath. Yep. So don't be head fake to think that the answer to everything is a face-to-face or a video conference. <laughs> in, lot, fact, right? in fact, there's evidence that you can listen more acutely with audio only. When you start to ask questions about what they haven't said, you start to get and train them into starting to say what they really mean and what matters most to the buying organization. When you accept the very first thing they say, you are on that path of discovery rather than that path of exploration we were talking about earlier on. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I love this part of your book. So let's, let's dive into a little bit more. You, you talk about listening to the unsaid. So, and you give a couple examples about how to, how to phrase that. So how, do, how does that come out in a conversation you're having with a buyer? Yeah, so let's think about it through the lens of what, the lens of when, the lens of who as examples, because they're all questions we Mm want to help them uh, progress. So in, in a business case context, the who question would be who else would be involved in the process of approving, who else will be involved in the process of evaluating who else. Mm-hmm. And I think for many of us, we're not comfortable asking those kinds of questions because we want to be liked and we want them to like us and we don't want them to feel like they're not the only decision maker. Right. It it doesn't matter. When, when you think about when kind of questions, so they'll say, oh, you know, we're looking to make an evaluation and a decision by the end of May. Great. Uh, when is the series of meetings that happen beforehand to approve that? Mm-hmm. Many of us will just go uh, straight into the tool, put in right. due date, 31st of May. Uh, it may not be because if you do a work back schedule with them and help them think it through, all of a sudden they realize it's not actually the end of May. It's probably going to be the August. beginning <laughs> of August. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, but it's being patient and empathetic enough to go, I am helping them with this question. If I help them walk back from the date they just gave me and go, Okay, what are the steps you use in procurement? Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of sellers all of a sudden go, I don't have something for May, but boy, I've got a clear understanding of the buying process between now and August. Right. The what questions are, what will you use to evaluate us against a competitor? What criteria are documented? Mm-hmm. How how are they weighted? I think just asking the second and the third question. After that, it kind of feels like an interrogation, right. and there's a new there's a nuance between questioning and interrogation. Yep. I, I, I sat in on a call. I had put the headphones on, and I was listening to uh, one of the newer, more enthusiastic sellers, kind of literally going through the script line mm-hmm. by line, and there were obviously answers and questions that the customer had given that meant all the other questions were irrelevant, but they followed the script. And did that create trust with the buyer? No, it didn't. Were they listening to them? No, they didn't. Did they complete the every field in the CRM system? Absolutely. And did the sales manager think that was a great call? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when we debriefed, um, what was obvious was the seller, I could notice a little change in their voice when the customer had basically said, you know, we're not not in the market. And he he went on the, we're not in the market branch of the questioning. But I I asked in that moment, what would be a more useful question to ask? And, And he said, I would like to know, what other problems they had, and which is an exploration mm-hmm. question, but I knew I had to follow the script. There is an art and a science to selling, and there's not enough art allowed in very structured selling scripts, and they're not orientated around the buyer. They're orientated around the seller. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. I was just taking a deep breath because, yeah, there's that's like, Three other episodes of the show we could talk about <laughs> to handle all of the things you just brought up in that one sentence, and but yeah, we're not going to. But it's it, we'll have you back and we'll do it. But, it, but let's 
let's work down to this this left unsaid thing because I I do want to make sure people understand before before we finish is because I thought it was you talk about a question theoretically or hypothetically could be what's yeah Mr. Prospect what's interesting to me is what you didn't say and just saying it that way I mean it's posed more as a a statement as opposed to a question but it's an implicit question but. Tell us about that, because I think that seems like it'd be very effective. It is when you're in the second half of an opportunity cycle or mm-hmm. you're in in relationship with a client or a prospect. I would definitely, Andy, I wouldn't use that question in first, my first, first, call. No, first, no, first, no, first no. call. Well, the, let's, let's be clear about that, because I think that it's, again, it's part of what you were talking about that we could unpack is that you have to earn the right to ask certain questions you just and i think this is a problem we see with with sellers and it doesn't matter whether you're an sdr making your your outbound call or if you're an ae taking over from the sdr Mm. you have to have that level of trust in order to ask certain questions and i work by side as well so i i see both sides of Mm -hmm. the of the coin and you want to drop trust in the first Five minutes of an initial call, here's the question not to ask. Mm-hmm. What keeps you up at night? <laughs> I hate that. That should be that and what are your pain points? Those should be banished from the sales lingo altogether, sales lexicon altogether. Yeah. When I work by side, I ask them, I know you hate that question. What, what's the question you would love to be asked? And they said, for goodness sake, they can Google my top five problems. Mm-hmm. So sellers who engender trust with me really quickly walk in, first call, get the rapport out of the way. And a phrase typically sounds like, for organizations we've worked with in industries like yours, the top three problems are A, B, C, which one of those would we discuss today? And straight away, you've created credibility because you've used some kind of social proof that you're working across mm-hmm. similar industries and A, B, and C. Now, the, the point is they don't care if it's not A, B, or C. They care that you're taking the time to understand the industry problem. Mm-hmm. And, and half the time, they're going to say it's D, because right. they trust you, because you've turned up and you haven't said what keeps you up at night, you've taken the time to go, the industry problems are A, B, and C. So for buyers, it's as important for them that the person they're introducing into their internal political network is somebody they trust. So a lot of sellers don't understand that you also need to be listening for the political landscape. And mm-hmm. are you going to be an ally who's going to create political capital for them? Or are you going to be somebody who's going to make them a political lamb to the slaughter? So a lot of people don't even listen at that level in terms of buying psychology because they're too busy asking a rote set of questions that they have to get through. Explore more, you'll discover more, not just on what they want to buy, but how it improves the political capital of the buyer inside the organization as well. Right. I mean, the thing is with with <laughs> scripted questions, overly scripted, overly rigid discovery questions, is the buyer understands that the assumption is there's only one solution to their problem. And you're not a real value to them if you're only thinking that there's only one solution to the problem because, you, A, you don't even know what the full scope of the problem is, the full magnitude of the problem from their perspective. And so, yeah, as, to your point, it's a real trust destroyer to drop in questions about, the, yeah, too early, what's keeping you up at night? Well, you should never use that one anyway, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> without, without going down that that line, yeah. Yeah, and back to your point about the question, uh, what's interesting to me is what you haven't said. Uh, a nuanced way to ask those questions is tell me more. Yep. Another way to ask that is and what else? Yep. Which and is what the I, third, I use. Yeah. Yeah. And the third one is uh, you need to be careful with this because done well, it's like a superpower and done poorly, it, it's just a waste of time. And you listen carefully for this one because it's the shortest 
phrase mm. that you can use, and not enough people use the pause. Mm. Right. But what it signals is a lot of executive presence on your part. A lot of people ask me, how do I increase my credibility with executives that are completely mismatched? They might be three or four decades down in the career path. Mm. Just pause. It's You're not getting paid for the speed of the answer, and they're not getting paid for the speed of the answer. You're being paid for the quality of the conversation, and the quality of the conversation will improve if you pause because I guarantee you, They're not used to it and they will fill the gap for you and they will fill the gap with a phrase like, actually, Mm -hmm. or they'll say, what's important that we haven't discussed is, now that I think about it a little longer, Mm -hmm. we should go over here. This division's got slightly different requirements. So those three things, what else? Tell me more and pause or silent. There's no coincidence that the word silent and the word listen have exactly the same letters in them and not enough sellers are taking the time to pause and listen to silent. Wow, we got an anagram. Um, Hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I think the pause is is really powerful. And I think if you're on a video call, if you're in person, obviously if you're just on the phone, not quite the same, but when you pause, pause. Don't write down something. Just pause. You're looking. You're maintaining eye contact with the person who is just talking. Really important. If you start writing everything down and they're waiting for you, they think they're just waiting for you to write to finish your notes. They're not going to be recognizing this pause is on them. Yeah. And Andy, here's some hacks on note taking. Uh, avoid taking verbatim notes. You shut down the neural pathway, the auditory part of the brain that can listen when you're writing verbatim notes. So take graphical notes or take short notes, very short notes that are action-based. And the most potent way for you to take a note is when somebody says something and you really want to make a note of that, you just say to them, look, what you said is so important. Do you mind waiting while I write that down? Right. I agree. And and you send a signal of respect to them, and they go, well, okay, well, that's important, and it was, and then noting it down. The difference between hearing and listening is the action you take. So please make sure you don't promise and commit to anything in a meeting that you can't deliver on because you're just showing that you're hearing rather than listening. Oh, I, I spoke to a world memory champion and he said that the fastest way to the mind's memory is to make sure your, your notes are graphical because you have more receptors in the brain. He's a German neuroscientist, mm-hmm. so he had a couple of advantages in being the world memory champion, but he would say, just draw graphical notes that mean something to you. Nobody else has to read the notes. Yeah, I mean, what would he use for, for graphics? Well, he, he, he mentioned in, in face-to-face, he would just draw uh, very simple shapes, circles, triangles, squares, and the relationships between those is what he was mapping for what he was doing. Interesting. Uh, I've interviewed a high court judge who uses a tree trunk as the center of the argument, the branches and the Mm -hmm. leaves supplementary to them. Uh, I've interviewed people who use graphical annotation and they say, listen for the capital letters when they speak in capital letters. And a lot of times people will signal that with the words, what's important to me Mm -hmm. is what's important Mm -hmm. to our organization Mm -hmm. is. That's where the capital letters come in. Just write that word down. Don't write the whole sentence or what sits around it. Often it's more the relationships there. So, Boris Conrad would say what's more important is capturing the relationship to the idea than the words that explain right. the idea. You'll remember that much longer. Yeah, it's interesting you brought that up because I, yeah, I tend to take notes in flow diagrams, hmm. flow charts. Yep. Uh, yeah, bubbles, arrows, connections. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about it in that context, but yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense because, yeah, if you're trying to transcribe what people are saying to you, you're not going to retain it. In fact, you'll look at your notes afterwards and not really be sure why that was important to the buyer. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've 
I've interviewed people who take accounts from people who've been in concentration camps or s- suffered some kind of trauma. They take no notes at all and take notes immediately after the meeting because they know they need to be present mm-hmm. to witness something that's important because note-taking drives down trust when it's not explained about right. how it's going to be used. So I think flowcharts, anything that's graphical will help the visual pathways in the mind process the idea because 40% of our brain processes and stores visually. So the auditory part of the brain is the least developed of the modern part of the Mm -hmm. brain. So the minute you start writing down, Andy just said he uses flowchart, what happens is you say that to yourself in your own mind. And while you're saying it to yourself in your head, you're shutting down the part of the brain that processes audio coming in by the ear. Yeah. Very interesting. I love that. All right, Oscar, we could go on forever. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, let's do this again. This was a lot of fun. And so uh, your book, Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, The best way to do that is uh, just visit listeningquiz.com. You can connect with all the stuff on social media. You can take a quick seven-minute quiz to see where your listening barriers are, and it'll give you a little personalized report to understand what's one practical thing you could do in your next sales call to improve what you're doing around your listening. So listeningquiz.com, that's the starting point Mm -hmm. to connecting with me. Excellent. Well, Oscar, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for listening, Andy. (laughs) I know you're going to throw that in there. (laughs) All right. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. As always, I'm ever so grateful for your support of the show. And I want to thank my guest, Oscar Trimbley, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you can also leave us a rating or a review, let us know how we're doing. We'd certainly appreciate that. You can do all that on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this episode is over. So thank you for your help. And as always, thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Ever wish you could coach like you've listened to every sales call without actually having to listen to every sales call? Conversation AI from RingDNA uses the power of artificial intelligence to help busy sales managers know exactly where to focus their coaching efforts. Learn which talking points are working and which are falling flat, ramp new reps faster, and help your entire team Master the art of conversation. Unlock your team's full potential with the power of AI. Learn more at ringdna.com forward slash CAI. That's ringdna.com forward slash CAI.